All right, welcome everybody to our uh, virtual session on managing remote workers. This is Pamela James. We're gonna give it another minute or so as everybody uh, enters our virtual auditorium. So just give us a moment and we'll begin with the introductions. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get going. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Pamela James. I'm the Executive Director for Campus Human Resources. And for purposes of this webinar, I'll be your MC for today. Really glad you were able to join us uh, for this series uh, on managing remote workers. Uh, this is the seventh of seven uh, sessions um, that we've offered. And um, at the end of this session, I'll show you how to get to all the previous recordings if you missed any of them or if any of your coworkers uh, miss them because they will be available uh, for everybody uh, afterwards. So uh, a little bit of housekeeping before I get to the introductions of our co-hosts and speaker. Um, this is a webinar versus a Zoom meeting. So it might be a little different than what you're used to with the meetings. Uh, so instead of a chat box being available, you've got a Q&A box. So feel free during the course of the session to enter your Q&A questions and we'll make sure that our co-hosts ask the speaker as many of those questions as we can get to during the time period. And if we don't get to all the questions, we'll have our speaker respond to them in writing and we'll send them out to you. Uh, so as a webinar, in a webinar format, you can see the co-hosts and the panelists, but you, we can't see you. So we'll be communicating with you um, through the Q&A. All right, well, with that, let's get to the show. First, I'd love to introduce our first um, co-host, and that is Brian Hervey. Uh, we have two vice chancellors here today as co-hosts. So Brian is the vice chancellor for university advancement and alumni relations. So Brian, welcome. Thank you for co-hosting. Tell us a little bit about your role and also why this topic is of interest to you. Well, thanks, Pamela. And uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you're safe and healthy and a couple of days ago, I had just been talking about COVID, but unfortunately today we're also talking about uh, the fires that are now in our area. And so I hope everyone is safe and uh, certainly uh, reach out to us if you need assistance uh, from your campus. Um, and so, uh, yes, I I'm, I'm, uh, uh, oversee the Alumni Association, the UCI Foundation and Advancement and Special Events and a few other areas uh, across the campus. And so this is a very timely, uh, a timely topic as you know, we've seen uh, that we're all very, very fortunate to be working for UCI at this time as the as the, the state and the campus have supported us, all of us as employees uh, through this, where we've been able to uh, to transition to this remote working environment. Uh, the, part of the trade off in my mind, at least, is that uh, while the state and the campus have invested in me and my team, that uh, we still have goals and we still have to meet uh, and, and provide the value to, uh, to the state and, and to our uh, community uh, that we always have. And so this to me is, is not just a temporary thing. This is a new way that we're doing business and uh, won't end anytime soon, uh, even after COVID. I think this is going to be changes that we will see and will, will impact our campus uh, from now on. So uh, very glad to be here, looking forward to the questions and, and certainly uh, really looking forward to the presentation and uh, what we can do to, to continue to be efficient. Great, thanks a lot, Brian. Next, I'd like to introduce um, Tom Andriola. So Tom is the Vice Chancellor for Information Technology and Data. Tom, how about you? Tell us a little bit about your role and why this topic is of interest to you. Sure, thank you, Pamela. So good morning, everyone. Uh, glad that you're here today and taking advantage of this wonderful program. Uh, as Pamela said, my role is uh, Vice Chancellor for Information Technology and Data. Uh, it's a relatively new role at UCI, and in addition to be responsible for all the technology needs across uh, the campus, the schools, and the medical center, I also get involved in a lot of our uses of how we're using our data to help our students succeed, to help our faculty continue to advance the science and discovery of their research, 
and how our clinicians are taking care of patients today. So I'm very, very happy to be here and, and to be co-sponsoring uh, co today's event. And Pamela, you asked a question why this is important to me. I, I'll give you two really, really personal reasons. One is, you know, as a leader at the campus, you know, we are in incredibly challenging times, both personally and professionally. All of us are being presented with unique situations and all of us are learning new skills and competencies of how to deal with this new world, which includes how, you know, we work and also as, as managers of people, people managers, how we manage people. Um, I like to tell people this in terms of my own history that one of the most, uh, the, the, the biggest development steps that I took as a people manager is the first time that I managed a remote workforce. We didn't call it a remote workforce. It had to do more with managing employees who were in multiple locations, but it was the first time that I was really responsible for managing performance and outcomes without being able to sit face to face with a person every day. And that developed some real growth and development from, from my standpoint. And I'm sure our speaker today will uh, will share with us some of the things and some of the, some of the research behind what works and what doesn't. All right, so I, I will be introducing today's speaker today. So I'd like to welcome to the UCI community, Vipas Ratanji. Vipas comes to us from Gallup, where he specializes in executive level engagement strategies and facilitates their consulting programs. He's an executive coach and a leadership consultant to senior executives and CEOs. He also specializes in performance management and has been a key researcher and integral advisor on that topic for Gallup. Vipas, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the ECI community and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's great to be here uh, talking about uh, a topic that Gallup has done a lot of research, uh, not just in the last, last year or in the last few years, but really since 1995. So what I'd really like to do in the, in the time that I have is to share with you a couple of things. One, as I mentioned, Gallup's been doing a lot of research in this area. So really talk about what we are finding around effective working uh, during times of, uh, during times of uh, not just COVID, but uh, of course, during times of remote working. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Now, also really talking about the tips and some of the tactics that you can use as managers to kind of take this forward. Now, before I kind of get into some of those tips and ta tactics, I wanted to just kind of lay out the overall research and what we're finding uh, as far as uh, remote working is concerned. Oops, there you go. Now, I, I mentioned that we've been doing this research for a fairly long time and we really think that the will of the workplace is changing and remote working is really a big part of that. So just to give you context, the number of remote workers in the US doubled according to our research between April and May of 2020. It went from 31% to about 65% and it continues to rise. Um, and 55% of those managers of remote workers say that they'll allow their employees to continue to work from home more often than they did prior to COVID-19. I think Brian, you mentioned, you know, this is something that's gonna stay with us even after COVID. So this is proof that, you know, that's something that organizations and managers need to really take into context. Uh, some employees have always worked remotely for at least a portion of their work. And then some employees have never worked remotely. So that's uh, an opportunity re really from kind of moving to a remote working scenario is new to not only them, but also their employees and their managers. So there's an another opportunity really to make sure that this is understood clearly. Now, I, I want to mention something here about remote working by itself. It's, it's uh, previously, it was kind of known as a perk. <laughs> it's a perk that you get the opportunity to work remotely. I think it's a struggle. In fact, uh, there's recent Harvard and NYU study for the National Bureau of Economic Research, where they said that uh, on the average, people are working about 48.5 minutes more than they were pre-pandemic, which is interesting. So that's precious time when you think about the time they're spending. Meeting lengths are about 20% lower, but number of meetings is 13% higher. So we're having shorter meetings, but having more of them. And that has huge implications in terms of performance, in terms of just work getting done. I mentioned that Gallup started his research in 1995. Just to give you an idea of how much this has changed, there's been a 400% increase in remote working since 1995. But, but think about that. Even though there's been a big shift towards remote working, management practices are unchanged. So really when you think about remote working, think about what in what ways does your management practice need to evolve and need to change, not only now, but going into the future. So when we started kind of thinking about and doing some research around 
this new uh, normal or this next normal that people are talking about uh, in terms of remote working is what we are finding. And what I'd like to do is talk about three key findings and then really talk about what is it that you can do around these, the implications of these three findings. So here's what we are finding up about the challenges of managing remote. Three key areas that you need to be focused on. One is individualization. So when people are in office, it's, it's easier to have one set of rules for everyone. But when you have people working remotely, what is really important is you kind of understand what the individual needs, their expectations, their experience, and the circumstances are. And I'll go through this in a bit. The second one was communication, just the ability to communicate, just the competence of communicating. You know, if, if you're only kind of uh, reacting or interacting with people remotely, or if you're only sending emails and not having that face-to-face -face interaction, if an email tone is too harsh, there's no facial expression to soften the sting. So that communication ability is something that also needs to be focused on. And the final one is accountability. And again, when everyone is physically present, it kind of tends to be easier to evaluate the level of effort people are putting in and the output your team is generating. But when everybody is spread, everybody is kind of working remotely, to be able to have a really good idea of performance uh, is gonna be very important. So our path today is really being focused on these three areas. So I'll talk a little bit about individualizing to remote workers, communication to increase performance outcomes, and then holding remote workers accountable. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Now on the right-hand side, you see kind of a, a diagram here. And this is kind of, if all of our research is underpinned by this larger shift from what we call boss to coach. So essentially, managers need to move away from being bosses to really being coaches and developers of people. And around that, you'll see these three elements that I talked about, establishing expectations, continually coaching, and creating accountability is key. Now, how you do that in a remote environment is gonna be very important. And when you think about a strengths-based, performance-oriented and engagement-focused workforce, uh, we'll give you some very specific tips and tactics based on our research uh, or what you can do to manage things like individualization, communication, and accountability. So let's start with individualization. Again, yeah, give you some research and some evidence around what we're saying, and then uh, kind of uh, end each section with some very specific tactics. So let's start about talking about kind of establishing expectations when you think about individualization. Now, here's what we're finding out. So what do employees really need from their managers? There are three key elements that I'll talk about. First is kind of individualized job clarity and priorities. One of the things that tends to happen in remote working is the ability to understand what's expected of you, uh, what's expected of you every day, every month, every week. That's something that is very important for managers to get a grip on. So that's the first one. The second one, ongoing feedback and communication uh, really helps kind of address ineffective and infrequent feedback. So even though you're remote, you're not really managing through silence. It becomes all the more important for you to be consistently talking, consistently coaching those who report into you. And the third one that like I talked about was accountability. How do you actually measure work performance when you're in a remote working environment? So that again, addressing kind of unfair evaluation practices or misplaced accountability. Now, underpinning all of that is once you do these three things right, you get the right job, clarity, have an ongoing conversation with accountability, that's the opportunity to learn and grow. So really, one of the main reasons why our Gallup suggests people leave an organization is because they don't have an opportunity to learn and grow. When you think about the remote working environment, making sure you apply these three tactics is a fundamental factor that will influence whether people stay in the organization or leave. Now, research suggests that that's going to be very important. Let's talk about the first element here in terms of individualization. Remote employees need you to individualize to their work-related needs. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'm sure some of you will remember this. This was a few years ago when you had, uh, this is the first example, or perhaps, or first public example of an individual who was having a conversation in the BBC uh, and, and, the, and the kid walked in. Uh, we all had a great laugh <laughs> at this at that time, but this is all our story today. All of us are in the same situation. But when you think of that individual, you think about the individual needs that that individual had, the individual family circumstances that they had, it's so important to start thinking of your employees in that context. Your, 
people who work with you, people who you're working with remotely through Zoom meetings, they have an individual life which is now open and exposed to everyone. Being able to understand that is key. So that individualization aspect is something that would be important to focus on. Now, how do you do that? Really starts with your listening. Listening is a main important point uh, and adjusting. So if you think about listening and adjusting, understanding the specific needs of an individual and then making those adjustments based on those needs. Uh, and I think what we're really saying here is you're managing to what they need, your remote workers, and not what you need. <laughs> There's a difference between the two. So you're kind of making sure you understand how that person thinks and feels. That's the key point. And there are a couple of ways you can do it. I mean, one is, of course, individualizing time. Uh, where structure is required, uh, you, you help uh, and support the individual. For example, um, if you have individuals who have children, you're able to actually uh, do uh, business or, or have conversation uh, where it's flexible for them. You know, I mean, for example, no crying children during an important business call, for instance. So that's the level of flexibility that is kind of important. Shortening meetings, and I know that you're doing that, we're doing that at Gallup as well, by five or 10 minutes to allow people to transition between calls to, to kind of alleviate the Zoom fatigue. Uh, or even kind of redefining available hours, you know, scheduling meetings in the afternoon and a child is napping might be a challenge. So or the meaning of close of business uh, can be 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m. So this level of individualization is something that is critical. Now, I'm going to give you a few uh, ideas on how you can make that, make that happen. And I talked about three key elements, individualized to strengths, individualized to engagement, and individualized to performance. And the, these are really the adjustments you're making. So when you think about the individual, their strengths, who they are, what their talents are, you need to adjust that conversation. You need to discuss how they can apply their unique talents and strengths to help them succeed in their role. Uh, in terms of engagement, uh, understand, and again, adjust the conversation, discussing on an ongoing basis what gets in the uh, way of people and their performance, what gets in the way of their engagement and their success. What are these engagement builders? What motivates them? What is it that gets in the way of their success? What are those barriers? And then when you think about performance and individualizing the performance, you're really kind of uh, discussing how to meet the situational or contextual circumstances so that you can really help employees achieve goals. Now, this sounds good in theory, but let me actually give you a few questions that will help you. So as you kind of start working with your remote employees, consider these questions. So when you think about the individual and their strengths, what do you need as a remote worker to stay energized? What have you enjoyed about remote working so far? What would you like to do more of? These are great questions to ask because you're again, focusing on the individual. In terms of engagement, how are you getting the information you need for your work or how are you staying connected with your partners? Are, you, are we sacrificing any quality with being remote? Again, this is opening up a conversation and that's the one that's critical. Uh, individualizing to performance. Uh, are any of your timelines in jeopardy? Uh, what worries do you have as a remote worker? How can you accomplish your work as a remote worker? Now, what I'm trying to say here is that every individual is different and their experience of remote work, their experience of interacting with you, their experience of performing is going to be different. What I really recommend that you do is for each of your remote worker, have this basic conversation. It won't take more than 10 minutes. If you have about five or six detect reports, that's about 50 or 60 minutes of your time. But when we teach some of this uh, in, in courses we do, for example, I've heard a lot of managers have those conversations that remote workers and get a very a, a new understanding of the challenges that each of those employees are facing. So I think that's something that I'd highly recommend. Individualization is kind of the first key, if you may, uh, around remote working. Now, what are the specific guidance here? First, I mentioned communication, but modeling that communication uh, in terms of the expectations for connecting with your employees. So this is something that's really important, consistently turning cameras on in all meetings. That level of visual interaction, the level of personal emotional connection is so important. And you need to encourage and participation in that. So you're gonna need to encourage other people to kind of have that visual communication as well. It's very difficult to have that emotional connection through even the Zoom uh, perspective, but the more you can involve people and have them turn their cameras on, it's almost a basic necessity. Here's another one. Before you send an email, consider if you could deliver the message another way. Uh, email is perhaps the most impersonal uh, you know, form of interaction. 
and uh, because you you're writing out a few words, but you're not really putting context behind those words. Are there other words? Could be as simple as just pinging people on an, an instant messaging software that you might have, or or just you know just getting into a Zoom room with them and so on. So those are ways in which you can do that. But one of the, our research is saying is that you know. Uh, besides email, there's so many other ways of interacting with individuals that create that level of emotional connection. So invest in that. So just basic communication. That's one. Adjusting your management style to your remote workers' individual talent is important. Uh, first of all, you need to understand your remote workers' talent, and then you can adjust your wording to their strengths. So if you have somebody who who has a strength for research or who has a strength for information gathering, you know that in a remote conversation, what they're really looking for is information. They're looking for input. Uh, they're looking for skills. So you kind of adapt and adjust your, your, your individual interactions with them around that. You might sometimes somebody else who wants to be all about action. You want to move on. They want to know what to do next. That's where you kind of adapt and adjust your interaction with that individual. But it starts with you understanding what those unique strengths, needs, and expectations are for each of those individuals. Leading with curiosity and questions to understand being understood before being understood. Some of those questions I mentioned are a great way of doing that. It's not a one-way interrogation. It really is about asking questions uh, and, and getting a sense of the life uh, those people are reporting to you are leading right now. Uh, not just their professional life, of course, but personal life as well. Now, ensuring you know employees' work time and home boundaries, home time boundaries is very important. So when you can reach them outside of work hours, if needed, it's almost, I'm not saying that you need permission for that, but in a way, yes, you're actually saying that, you know, the world has changed for them as well. So what are the ways in which you can interact and when is it that you can interact with them? Now, one could argue that, of course, there's a, a time period that you have, which is work time. But, you know, so much of this has been turned around with kids working, kids in school, in house, in the house and so on. So those are things that are important when you consider when, how, and where to interact with those you're managing. And then really establishing a feedback system that captures employee and customer inputs. Uh, there are a couple of ways of doing this, skip level conversations, you know, because what tends to happen, as I mentioned, there's a lot of meetings that are going on, uh, uh, shorter meetings. So it's, when you have shorter meetings and many meetings, there's, there's a challenge around how much of that information is retained by individuals. So hosting skip level conversation helps sometimes to make sure that you're following up uh, on things or getting a great sense of what's happening uh, with the larger organization. So that's something that uh, we'd urge you to do. Uh, ensure connections between peers are happening. And I'll add one more thing to it. Ensure learning between peers are happening. This is a great opportunity to almost create a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, and then conducting kind of uh, weekly focus groups, perhaps to stay connected with your remote workers. So these are just some examples of what uh, you could do based on our research to adjust. Again, I'm emphasizing the word adjust. These are very different times uh, than before. So adjusting to the individual needs is incredibly important. Let's talk about communication. That's kind of the next big element that uh, we talked about and kind of continually coaching. I mentioned this earlier, but communication with remote workers is not optional. It's required for performance excellence. Uh, even during normal times, we feel, even during pre-pandemic times, uh, we feel that there are, there are challenges around the level and the frequency of interactions. Even when everybody was on site in the building, I'll give you some data around that. Uh, this is pre-pandemic. Most managers deliver very infrequent feedback. So when you look at this uh, from our Gallup polling data, how often do you receive feedback from your managers? Uh, only 7% said daily, 19% said a few times a week, about 27% a few times a month. And, and, and look at this, about almost one in two, a few times a year or less. So when you really think about frequent conversation, even pre-pandemic, that was a big challenge. And as I mentioned, the new way of working is more meetings, but shorter meetings, very to the point, it leaves out the opportunity to really connect, to emotionally engage with those that you're leading. Now, does that actually have an impact on how engaged you feel at work? Uh, now, again, I'm not talking about remote workers here, but let's look at how these interactions actually have an impact on engagement uh, and manager engagement, really. So here's some more data points here. So you've got how often do you receive feedback from your manager? That's from the previous slide. And when um, amongst those who said, well, daily, 
Uh, 36% said, my manager provides meaningful feedback to me. 29% said, my performance is managed in a way that motivates outstanding work. And out of those employees who had daily interactions, 47% are engaged. So I just run down that line and see, as frequency, the, the, the communication becomes infrequent, what happens? The level of engagement drops from 47% to 15%. My manager provides meaningful feedback from 36 to 6. My performance is managed in a way that motivates outstanding work goes from 29% to 80%. This is pre-pandemic, and this is for all employees. You can imagine what that looked like um, for remote workers during these times. So here's the point we're trying to make. You need to have continuous feedback conversations. And that's a little different from micromanaging because you might have the expectation that if I'm, if I'm talking to my people, too often, and is that micromanaging? In fact, a lot of our research suggests that all frequent communication and conversation done right is actually seen as meaningful for employees. So what about remote working? Uh, is that something that, if you were to just look at this analysis just by remote workers, is what we're finding out, major impact. These are all remote workers in our panel. So when you think about remote workers who have once a year or less, a few times or more, a few times a month, and a few times a week or more. Remote workers who have interactions with their managers a few times a week or more are 53% engaged. That's a really high number. But it's what I found really interesting in this data is if I were just to draw a line here, here's what we're seeing. Just moving from a few times a year, just a few times a month, that escalates engagement dramatically from 16% to 44%. Just moving you're, you know, you're having those interactions even once a month. Uh, and when I say interactions, I do not mean uh, work meetings or even individual work meetings. This is a very focused conversation about the individual, about how they're doing at work, their personal lives and so on. That's that kind of that focused view is what we're talking about. Now, there's a lot you can do. There are many ways you can interact even when you're working remotely. Uh, here's what our research suggests. You know, this is what's happening today. Uh, phone only is about 1%. Digital teams are Zoom and those about 11%. Face-to-face -face and digital, so video, 16%. Phone and digital, 4%. No daily communication, 32%. So um, there are a lot of opportunities now, and there will be a lot of opportunities in the future to really leverage technology to make that difference. So having those, as I mentioned, face-to-face -face and digital, that tends to have the highest impact and engagement. So net-net is what we're saying. There's a significant impact on weekly versus annual communication. So when you think about remote workers, if you compare those two modes of interaction, uh, uh, so remote workers are three times more likely to strongly agree they're motivated to do outstanding work if they have meetings uh, more, more frequently, or three times more likely to be engaged in work. So the good news here is when managers do become effective performance coaches, remember I talked about the boss to coach, substantial impact. Uh, just simply creating that frequency of feedback to weekly, their feedback can become meaningful, uh, effective and engaging. Here's the opposite of that. I don't know whether you, some of you are familiar with this, but there's, this, there's a lot of uh, uh, news about online workplace surveillance and keystroke tracking, keystroke tracking. So just always kind of micromanaging, trying to figure out what employees are doing. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about one-on-one, -on -one, uh, energizing, engaging conversations that you can have. And you can make a difference as managers because you know we were talking a lot about engagement. Is what our research says. Our research says that 70% of the variance on employee engagement is the manager. Imagine that when you think about remote working, you as a manager, can, do, can create such a significant impact on how employees feel about their work and their lives. So I mentioned that you know, communication should be ongoing. Uh, what should that look like? A very simple way of thinking about it is these five types of conversations. And we've done a lot of work in this area, but from establishing expectations that during the beginning of the year to creating accountability and progress review at the end of the year. So if you think about those two bookends, there is so much you can do in between whether it's quick connects, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or whether it's check-ins, uh, 30 minutes to 40 minutes, once a month, like I mentioned. Or the other one is very focused developmental coaching. So when you see something that the individual has done really well uh, or something that requires uh, feedback, 
use that as an opportunity for developmental coaching. So that's, that's another way of doing it. So some advice here again on continual coaching. One, find ways to create social interactions. Um, call your colleagues instead of emailing them. I mentioned that. Uh, chat about your weekends or evenings, if you have a TV show, uh, always encourage video. Uh, encourage your re uh, remote employees to call their best friend at work to virtually eat lunch together. I actually work with an organization who does that because that's what's happening. People are working uh, on their desks. There's a lot of social isolation that happens. So when you think about preventing social isolation, uh, reschedule meeting for non-productive times of the day, often later in the day. Uh, include social uh, interaction time in the agenda. There's something that you can do within the agenda to make sure that you are uh, interacting and engaging. Uh, otherwise, you're going from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting with very little emotional connection at the beginning of the meeting. Every, at the beginning of the meeting, spend about a minute or so to kind of reorient, re-engage with people that you're managing. Uh, just as you would typically stop by an office, you can stop by virtually. Um, and don't rely on the calendar to connect authentically. You know, it's good to have calendar reminders and so on, but you need that authentic expression of management, which is going to be key. I'm going to go through the last one, then we're going to co open up for questions, but this is the toughest one. Yeah. When you think about, well, you know, the world has changed. Uh, performance has changed. How you manage and measure performance has changed. What do you do with that? How do you hold remote workers accountable? Like I mentioned, uh, uh, you're not just measuring and managing exactly every second of the day that individual is being productive or not, but you're really focusing on performance. Uh, that's true, measuring uh, is important at the end of the day. Uh, I think Brian mentioned the, the value to the state and the community, how do we measure that, the goals that are important. So here's some advice, but first, uh, Don Clifton, our, our, um, our founder mentioned this, which is a great quote, nothing happens until someone expects something of you in ways you can achieve, in ways you can achieve. That's the one that's really, that's the key word there, in ways you can achieve. Now, who determines the ways you can achieve? And this is where I'll talk a little bit about setting goals, even with remote workers. But first, uh, to hold remote workers accountable, a couple of things are important. Clear and collaborative and aligned expectations. The clarity part is the most important one. It's the fundamental requirement. So setting those performance expectations, knowing and ensuring that the employee is clear about the duties and responsibilities for which they're responsible. Uh, and that is, and they're defining what outstanding, acceptable and unacceptable looks like. So those frequent conversations, you're defining it really well. Collaborative is important rather than saying, you're the one who's determining it, here's the goal. Actually, our research suggests that when employees are involved in the process of goal setting for themselves, in fact, we've seen that people who employees actually set a goal for themselves somehow sometimes tend to set a goal higher than the manager would set for them. But having that collaboration when you think about goal setting is key. So having that collaboration, collaborative goal setting is key. And aligned uh, at the end of it, um, uh, individuals and teams perform better when an employee is responsible for not only kind of individual goals, but team goals as well as organizational goals. So always linking what people are doing to the mission and the purpose of the organization is key. Uh, and, that, and that's true, you know, in a way when you have employees who are re working remotely, you need to have them keep connecting to the larger picture, to the bigger picture and the purpose of the organization. And there's some trouble here uh, in terms of being able to do that because our research again shares, I talked about clear collaborative aligned. A six in 10 employees, according to our database, uh, uh, clearly know what's expected of them at work. Four in 10 actually walking in or not walking in, you know, interacting remotely, not entirely sure about what they're expected to do. Uh, and 26% of employees strongly agree, only 26% that the manager continually helps them clarify priorities. So being able to kind of check, are you clear? Uh, are you clear about the goals? Are we clear about the goals, the team goals, the organization goals, your individual goals on an ongoing basis is very important rather than assuming that, yeah, we've, we've communicated it once, we retrace this at the end of the year. It's very important to do that in a continual fashion. So uh, there are three levels of expectations. There are individual achievements, collaboration, and what we call customer value at the end of the day. What is it that you're trying to impact, whether it's a patient or an end customer that you're trying to interact? Start thinking of goals from the perspective of these three levels. Because essentially what we're saying here is creating accountability in remote workforce requires different types of conversations. And I mentioned a few of these earlier, 
anticipating, not just presuming, but anticipating, focusing people on what's important, prioritizing uh, what needs to be done, and again, learning from their past successes as well. So that individualization again comes to play here. Here's the last kind of um, key set of ideas here around guidance for managers, and then we can open this up for, for questions in a conversation. Uh, so when you think about performance accountability, you need to start with defining success clearly. So ensuring remote workers know what the metrics are, what are they gonna be measured on, and that you're able to kind of track them over a period of time and have frequent conversations. Um, collaborate, I mentioned shared goals and shared collaboration uh, on the fairness and accuracy of these metrics. Now, the reason why this is important is that how you're defining productive and performance is very ambiguous uh, in this time and in the time of remote working. So being having an honest conversation about what's expected, what can be expected, what's difficult and what's challenging is a first step. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to calibrate, but the conversation itself is really important to make sure that you're individualizing performance accountability for them. And then define what success is for each metric. Just the, the need for clarity on this, I think is even more uh, for those who are working remotely. Once you've done that, of course, validate their expectations. Uh, ensure that you repeat those expectations to them. Ensure extreme clarity on what's expected. Converse and clarify any thoughts about those expectations and then collaborate frequently. So what you're really saying here is rather than saying, we set the goal, we're gonna do a performance review at the end of the year, two months down the line, asking questions like, how are you doing? Uh, what's been good? What's been successful? What's not been? Are there any barriers? What can I help you with as a manager? So that collaboration frequently is important because expectations are changing all the time. So that almost necessitates the need for frequent uh, check-ins around the goals and how people are doing. There's a final one here, uh, connecting expectations to your larger purpose. Can't uh, uh, emphasize this more. Uh, where you're saying you discuss how their work affects internal customers and external customers. How you're driving value. Uh, align goals with the, their expertise that use customer impact. What is it about your specific expertise that connects to us delivering as an organization is what we're talking about. And then discussing often how their work ties to the mission and purpose of your organization. Uh, I, I remember right in the peak of the pandemic, um, uh, a New York hospital, uh, instead of doing huddles, they were doing huddles, but they started calling them hope huddles. Uh, and, and the idea was not to talk about how many people got on ventilators, uh, but how many of them got off ventilators. So this, this connecting to the purpose and the focus of the organization is what we're talking about. So in summary, the space, place, and pace of work is changing when you think about remote working. These three strategies, according to Gallup research, are key. Individualization, accountability, and communication. And then really start thinking about a worker's needs. What are the basic needs? What are the individual, very specific needs? What are the needs from a teamwork point of view, how they work together? And how about development growth? What are those needs? So we hope these are um, um, uh, some tactics and tips and some research that will be valuable to you. There's a lot that Gallup does in terms of research. You can actually go to gallup.com and we have a lot of research papers we've written on remote working. Uh, uh, I'm happy to share some of those as well. With that, let's get to questions. I think this is where I, uh, do I stop sharing here? Or can we leave this up? Right, you can stop sharing. There you go. All right, I think Tom has a question. Yes, uh, one question came in. Is there a way through technology to verify that a remote worker actually is working at home, such as keystrokes, trackers, et cetera? Uh, thank you for the question. So I, I think uh, Vivas talked you know, well about, uh, made a nice uh, uh, let's say suggestion around this. You know, it, it's not so much about trying to uh, mandate or, or, or measure compliance as much as it is, is really trying to establish goals and, and, and you know, hold people accountable to, to, to outcomes. Um, one of the phrases that has stuck with me over the course of my career is, uh, we manage things, but we coach people. Right. And so, you know, the key for me is not so much trying to make sure people are sitting at their desk, which is a paradigm, you know, that's re been reinforced with us when we worked in the office is really trying to, you know, as Vipas uh, so eloquently said, it's establishing those mutual goals 
and then helping people achieve those goals. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we trust our people to accomplish, you know, their tasks as part of the organizational mission. And that's where at least I like to put my focus when, when, when working with our people. I'd agree with that. I mean, keystroke tracking, there are a lot of apps. What's funny is that there are new apps that actually uh, kind of uh, try to get, go around keystroke app, tracking apps by opening up programs randomly. So it looks like the employee is actually working. And that's the whole point. It's not about tracking productivity as defined by hours spent in front of the computer is not a really good metric, but defining performance based on those clear goals and individualization is what we're talking about. Great question. Great. Well, thank you very much Vip Haas for the presentation. Uh, we have also have a submitted question for you. So in all of our Zoom meetings, we have a camera on philosophy in order to maintain a level of personal connection during the workday. But many staff refuse to participate, citing privacy concerns and viewing into their home space. I'm interested in some tactics managers can use to compromise on these issues at the supervisor employee level and increase the sense of individual connection to the team. That's a great question. I do feel that getting on the camera is a personal choice. Uh, but, uh, you know, so mandating that perhaps, uh, you know, I don't know whether it'll yield the right kind of outcomes, but here's the point, individualization again. So if you're saying you can't perhaps be on, on camera, try to understand why, why, why not? You know, so that conversation itself becomes important. And you finally will, you know, get to kind of an agreement perhaps, you know, maybe use a backdrop like you're using, uh, Brian, for instance, maybe that's something that negates. But maybe the reason is because you have children working in the background, perhaps, or there might be other reason why people don't want to show the background that they have at home. But individualization is key here. Uh, just like keystroke tracking, you're not forcing people into a situation, but you're trying to understand what the needs are. And you're individualizing, not to what you need, but what they need. And that's the key difference and adjustment you've got to make in your work. Okay. Vivas, we have a question from Matthew. Uh, we are using Microsoft Teams and it started to use Microsoft to-dos and planners. Are there any other tools that people have found easy to use to track projects and productivity? I don't know whether I can talk about technology, but we use Microsoft Teams as well and we do so exceedingly well. One of the things that's, that's happened with us is the degree of alignment because you can actually do a lot more collaboration, joint collaboration, like opening up a Word document and then collaborating on it and that stays at one place that you're sharing, I think that's that's huge. I don't think we've done that level of collaboration before. I mentioned this thing about um, you know meetings. I, I think that's an interesting one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you these numbers again. Meeting length has gone down 20%. Number of meetings has gone up 13%. Number of people in meetings has gone up 14%. There are more people spending less time but having more of those meetings. Now imagine that level of, uh, um, you know, lack of clarity that can emerge from that. That's why these kind of, um, I don't think we use Microsoft Teams enough, by the way, for collaboration. I think we need to encourage people to use more in terms of collaboration and so on and so forth. But you go through this uh, dizzying Zoom day, you go through six or seven of those meetings. One of the things I always do is at the end of the day, I take stock of all the meetings I've had. And that's important. Sometimes you forget, in, you know, what are the meetings you had the entire day? I always take stock of it to say, well, the first Zoom meeting was this and here's what we talked about. And I make a little note for myself saying, here's what I got out of this meeting. Here's the second meeting is what I got out of it. Here's a call out for me or here's an action for me. So and you can use that and you share it on Teams and so on. But I think it's, again, it's not really about the technology. The technology enables you in many ways. It's human interactions at the end of the day. Uh, it's the emotional decision-making. Danny Kahneman, some of you are probably familiar with that, the Nobel Prize economist, who's actually not an economist, actually a psychologist, said that 70% of human decision-making is emotional. So when you think about that emotional decision-making, these technologies and this augmentation of technology will give you a lot, but it's poor substitute for human interactions. So keep interacting is what I'd say. On video, preferably. So I have another submitted question. This one is kind of related to the previous question. Uh, so this uh, probably for Vib Haas and maybe Tom uh, on, a little bit on this one too. Uh, it says, while we encourage turning on camera during meetings, 
We also hear about internet connectivity issues and hence keep their cameras off. How do we address this issue? Tom, you wanna to give it a shot first and then. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, this is a challenging one. Um, you know, some people don't know this statistic, but you know, when uh, COVID hit and we all went to this remote workforce, uh, the uh, internet experience roughly a 10x uh, increase in capacity, you know, and, and we're talking about an internet, a you know, global internet that was already working at about 100 times what it was designed for, right? So we have really, really stressed the infrastructure uh, in order to, uh, you know, figure out how to keep operating society. Uh, what I'd say is, is this, right? Because, you know, employees working from home means that, you know, they, in most cases, have set up their own kind of mechanism through their cable provider or some other internet service provider, is work with them, you know, and, and try to figure out if you've got the latest and greatest equipment in your house associated with being able to create the most stability. You may be lucky enough to live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of good infrastructure, maybe not, you know, that's kind of uh, not something that, that you can do a lot about or we can do a lot about. The other thing I would say, and I know that I do this because I've always been a frequent traveler, is, you know, the tele you know, the, your uh, mobile phone also can operate as a hotspot. And when push comes to shove, if you've got that enabled on your phone, it does cost you a little bit extra uh, in your monthly amount. It can serve as that kind of place if you really need to go. It's just your phone, your computer, and you and you have at least that type of stable connection. So that's some of the tricks I've learned along the way. Yeah, I have nothing else to add here. I think you you covered it. No. Okay, uh, we've got a question uh, from Danny. Uh, what strategy would you recommend in obtaining leadership buy-in and trust as it relates to a staff member that is performing much better now working remotely as compared to performance during a normal work environment? Great question. Danny, if you want to take it, uh, uh, that's all you would do. All right, great. So I think I, I mentioned this a little earlier, and that's the third key that I talked about creating accountability. Now, what I really want to understand is what happened. In fact, what was absent previously that this, this, this change, the performance change. And I can tell you this pattern where it, first you need to understand what those barriers were that existed in the way of that person's performance. Because when you put them back into a situation, in a scenario where they have to start again, not being remotely working well, but at work, the performance might fall down again. Again, individualization, what is it that working remotely enables this person to do, right? And not going straight into policy and standards and all of that, but really having that individualized conversation. What works? Now, if that person's goal or role is not dependent or, or requires physical presence, and there might be obviously roles that require physical presence, but if they don't, performance speaks for itself. That's where you want them. Right? Maybe you can have some kind of a conversation with them saying, well, out of the four days or five days, maybe you kind of come in one day or two days because it's very important for team alignment. But if it's already working and performance has been exponential, I'm assuming it's been exponential after people, uh, after that individual started working remotely, stick with that. That drives that individual's performance. That would be my advice rather than saying, well, let's not force this person to come back in. Again, if this individual doesn't necessarily have to be uh, in an office or a physical space. Again, individualization, that's our biggest key. Focus on what their needs are and what drives their performance. Great. Well, Vibhas, as managers, we also carry the role as a mediator. We will encounter conflict among our staff members. I'm interested to know what are your ideas and tips? Oops, my question just dis disappeared. <laughs> uh, let me go to a different screen and see if I can find that one again. Sorry about that. Okay, here it is. I am interested to know uh, what are your ideas, tips to help address this issue? Can you read that last part again? I, I sure can. I'm sorry, it got broken right there in the middle. Uh, so let me read the whole question. Uh, as managers, we also carry the role as a mediator. We'll encounter conflict among our staff members. I'm interested to know what are your ideas and tips to help address this issue? That's a very broad question, <laughs> I think. And uh, conflict resolution, isn't that what managers do at the end of the day? Um, uh, well, I mean, really depending on what the conflict's about. I mean, that's, again, I'm going to get to the root of what the conflict's about. But I think for managers, what tends to happen is kind of looking at that objectively and almost in an impersonal way is important because 
what you don't want to do is as a manager get involved in the emotional storm of why that's happening having that objective view of the conflict the rationale the reason for the conflict the data and the evidence around that conflict is where you need to start because what tends to happen is that a manager takes on themselves the responsibility and it's actually a reflection on the manager like it's a reflection on me that there's a conflict no it's not a reflection on you well it's you need to manage it but let's start with the objective view of why that conflict is happening uh, and then the difficult part is harmonizing you know at the end of the day different views and different priorities and different competing views and so on i think that's going to be very important but fundamental to all of this is trust i think if you are engendering a certain level of trust conflicts will happen but as long as you are objective and trustworthy and I, when you think about trust it's really interesting i'm going to uh, give you a very simple kind of formula for this which i've loved and it's it, there's a book called the trusted advisor by david meister and he defines trust as reliability credibility and intimacy if you think about this i'm reliable as a manager i'm credible do i create intimacy divided by self orientation so the higher the self orientation doesn't matter if you're reliable credible or you're creating intimacy trust is not going to exist to my previous point that i was saying if the focus is not on you if you're not oriented towards you you're focused on them you're focused on what their needs are you're not oriented towards them uh, towards yourself but towards them that's the way to create trust and if you have that trustworthy relationship you can deal with any conflict that comes your way thank you so much vipas believe it or not we are out of time uh, unfortunately we didn't get to all the questions but we will ask vipas and our co-hosts to answer those questions and send them out to all of the attendees so first thank you so much vipas for a great presentation uh, and lively dialogue and a special thanks also to our co-hosts um, tom and brian for uh, allowing uh, your employees to get to know you a little bit and to to ask some of your own questions Uh, so what you see here are um, all of the webinars we've presented over the past seven weeks. If you missed some of them, they're available uh, recorded on our, our Working Well Remotely website, and there's a link. We'll send this out to everybody as well. So with that, we want to give you that benefit of time. We, we went one or two minutes over, my apologies, but hopefully you found this valuable and feel free to share it with colleagues. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.